My guest today is a theologian, writer, and fishing lure designer. He also is the director of Perichoresis Ministries. He's a native of Prentice, Mississippi. He and his wife, Beth, have been married for 30 years and have four children. A lifelong student of psychology, he has degrees in political science, divinity, and earned his Ph.D. from the King's College, Aberdeen University in Aberdeen, Scotland, under Professor James B. Torrance. He is the author of eight books, including The Great Dance, Jesus and the Undoing of Adam, and Across All Worlds, the international bestseller The Shack Revisited, and his most recent book is Patmos. He has recently written a powerful essay on the mediation of Jesus Christ that I look forward to unpacking with him today. He teaches around the world. He's an avid outdoorsman and holds two United States patents for his fishing lure designs. He's also the founder and president of Mediator Lures. Welcome to the Messy Spirituality Podcast, Dr. C. Baxter Kruger. It is a great privilege to welcome to the podcast today our most requested guest in the history of the podcast, Dr. C. Baxter Kruger. Dr. Kruger, thank you so much for joining me. Oh, man, I'm glad to be here. Privilege, Jason. Really, really privilege. We we share a lot of spiritual stories, uh, you know, personal journeys on this podcast. Would you mind starting us off by telling us about your spiritual backstory? Were you raised in an atmosphere of faith? I grew up uh, from my mother's womb in Calvinism, um, conservative five point Calvinism. I memorized the child's catechism. I was working on the shorter catechism. I have a perfect uh, thirteen year perfect Sunday school attendance pen. We were heavily churched. Um, and I loved it. I loved the the sermons were always theologically informed. Uh, but uh, if my mother was here, she would tell you, as, as she has told me many times, that I was born with questions. And she said, I was there when you were born and you, were, you had questions then. But, but somewhere around 10 years old, uh, sitting in the pew with my mom and dad and brothers, and a ticker tape went across my, the front of my mind. And you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water, joy unspeakable, full of glory, the glorious liberation of the sons and daughters of God. And uh, all verses that I had learned in that church um, in Sunday school, and I didn't realize at the time what was happening. Uh, now I can look back and see uh, that Jesus was asking me a very simple question. And that question was, Baxter, um, are you content that what you are experiencing right now is this freedom that I promised, this knowing of the truth that sets you free. Are you content that uh, you are experiencing the river of living water, that you know joy unspeakable? You know what Paul meant by the glorious liberation of the sons of God. I, I was not conscious of it. I do remember the moment very vividly. And I guess I must have said no, because that basically has been my whole life's journey. Uh, what is the truth that sets us free, and why would anybody compromise until they experience the freedom? And what in the world is the river of living water, and how does that work? What does that mean? I want that. And the glorious liberation of the children of God. I mean, goodness me. There's, there's The New Testament is packed with just astounding statements and promises from Jesus. And I, I was a lover of John's gospel very early on. So... That began my pilgrimage, and I look back and see that, that one way of summarizing my entire life is the question, what is the truth that sets you free? Well, that that's pretty incredible for uh, at the young age. I think you said 10 years old. You had this, Jesus was asking you questions. I mean, did were you aware of how unusual that was for someone that age? No, I, I, was, <laughs> I was not. I um. I just assumed and it was not a statement about anybody else in the room or about that church or our fellowship or anything. It was a question to me. And um, I have subsequently had great conversations with Jesus about my life that he has pointed out some things that were both funny. And and, uh, and one thing I'll say at the beginning, um, let me let me just tell this story real quick. There was a um, a master carpet weaver. And uh, he had a six-year-old granddaughter who was pestering him uh, to to let her help him make a carpet because you know when you're six you know everything. And so on his seventh on her seventh birthday, the master carpet weaver he was the best in the world, world famous, presented her as a gift on her birthday two of his favorite uh, needles, and taught her three stitches. 
and set her up to start weaving. And he started on the other end. And he was watching her, and he realized from the very beginning that she did not get a single stitch right. Not one. Every stitch was different. Every stitch was a mistake, technically. But he loved her so much, and he was so creative that he steadily incorporated her mistakes into his master's plan. And when they met somewhere in the middle, it was another masterpiece. And I, I love that story because most of us spend a lot of our lives trying to, we believe that we have to get it right. We have to get it right. And I, I don't believe that we have to get it right. I don't believe that we were ever designed to be righteous. I don't believe that we were designed to be wise. I don't believe that we were designed to be perfect. I believe that we were designed to participate in the right relationship of the Father, Son, and Spirit. We were designed to participate in their goodness. We were designed to participate in their perfection. And by that, I mean that the Father, Son, and Spirit are in the business of taking our mistakes and making something perfect out of them. And that's the advantage point. I'm 61. I look back on my life. I see how it was not only the great theological questions and the burdens that Jesus shared with me at a young age, but he has masterfully incorporated all of my stupidity and my mistakes and, and sins and even my willful stupid stuff has been woven. And, and I call the Holy Spirit a redeeming genius. And the Holy Spirit doesn't. Does it, the Father, Son, and Spirit don't do redemption on Monday. They are always redeeming. It's what they do, and they love it. And Paul Young captures this in the shack beautifully when the Holy Spirit's digging around in, in the garden with Mackenzie, and the garden just so happens to be the mess of Mackenzie's soul, and the Holy Spirit loves it. And the way she sees it and interprets it and the way he interprets it are two different things. And um, I think that's just... It's so liberating to know that my father doesn't do, our father doesn't do abandonment. He does creation and redemption. And the Son and the Holy Spirit are right in the middle of it all, always with all of us. So if you hear me say anything uh, in this podcast, before we get to talking about uh, deeper theological matters, I want to put that on the table because that's the truth. That's really the truth. That's the way uh, that's the way it is. I remember the scene in the movie, The Shack, where Mackenzie is taken to the garden and it's just a mess. But at the end of that movie, that garden is just beautiful. It's eclectic. I, I don't know any gardener that would design a garden to look like that, but it's beautiful, living, creative. And if God can do that with our lives, that is, uh, that, that's hope for all of us. What do you think led us to this position where we feel like we have to get it right in order to live up to the idea of a masterpiece? Well, the masterpiece, the carpet, is us. And, and uh, the Lord never violates our wills, never does anything without our participation. So I think the reason why we think we have to get it right is the fall of Adam, and I think that uh, it's birthed religion. I often say, I am going to come back to a little bit of my journey because it makes a larger sense of what we're talking about now, but, but I want to stay on this theme just for a minute, but that the Lord is so personal with us and deals uh, – Sometimes gently, sometimes two before, because that's what each, you know. Some of us, some of us need. But I love the story because we are the sacrament, and the Lord is the one who knows what a sacrament is and what it's supposed to quote unquote be. But we feel like we have to get it right. And I often say this: that religion, and nowadays I want to add politics. Religion and politics are what we do as human beings when we do not know that Jesus Christ is in us, and that our Father loves us forever that the Holy Spirit's a religion and genius. Religion is what we do when we assume that we are separated from the Father, Son, and Spirit. That assumption is written in, into the fallen mind. That's what Adam and Eve believed in the garden. You can go back and read it and see how they bought the lie. She saw the fruit, the fruit as desirous to make one wise. And the temptation was, you will be like God. 
Well, that is to, to get them to assume that they're not when they have been created in the image and likeness of God, and they were never designed to be wise. They were designed to participate in the wisdom of God, which is vastly superior to anything that we can bring to the table. So I think we believe we have to get it right because we assume we're separated. And that assumption, and that's what John calls the darkness. The assumption of separation is the darkness. It may be like a mama spider with a thousand babies on its back, but there's only one mama spider. And that is the assumption that we're separated from the Father, Son, and Spirit. It's written into the fabric of of the fallen mind. It's given birth to religion. And what we see happening right now in the United States of America is that uh, we have assumed we're separated, and there's two ways we can try to get back. One is the secularist view. We don't need God. We create life on our own terms. And the other is the religious view. Uh, we're separated. We've got to get back. Here's how you get back. And so once you, you bite the assumption of separation, and once you bite into way back to God, number uh, uh, one, 127b, then you're now committed to 127b as the way, and now you're against every other way. So you're going to spend your time defending your position and arguing that everybody else is wrong, all the while missing out on seeing what is, that this world was created uh, in and through and by Jesus Christ, and not one thing came into being apart from him. That's the emphatic message of the apostles. Uh, We'll talk about that a little later on, I suspect. Not one thing came into being. So why are we running around the world telling everybody they're separated? you got to get back by coming and joining our way back to God. Uh, Religion is what we do in in our sense of separation. Jesus hammered it in the parable of the, quote, prodigal son. you got two brothers. One's religious and one's a secularist. Both uh, are creating what they think is life, and at least the younger son came to realize, I don't know what life is, and I'm going to return to my father's house. The older brother, uh, and this is the reason Jesus told those, those three parables, the older brother, if you look, it's fascinating. It's there in the text. The father goes out to entreat the older brother in the spirit. And the older brother, is he says, Father, I have never neglected a single solitary command of yours. Not one. That's religion. I have gotten it right. And this whoremongering son of yours comes straggling in from the far country. Everybody knows what he's up to. And he smells like pigs. And look at you. You run to meet him and embarrass yourself in front of the town. And what else do you do? You put your robe on him and your, your ring and your sandals on him and you throw a feast. It's not fair. And, and if you go back and look at the, at the beginning of the story, a certain man had two sons. The younger said he wanted his share of the estate. It says the father divided his wealth between them. This is the folly of religion. The older brother already owns it all, and he's angry with his father that his father won't bless him according to his obedience. That's what Jesus was saying. Religion is a lie because it begins with the assumption of separation, and it's all about what we think we've got to do right to get back to get to God. All the while, our Father in heaven doesn't do abandonment. He sent his son into the far country, both of religion and the far country of secular darkness, to lay hold of us and bring us back to his Father, which he has already done. So the gospel is not the news that we can receive Jesus Christ into our lives. The gospel is the news that Jesus has received us into his life. Now, who sees it? He who sees that or she who sees that is experiencing the freedom that Jesus promised. And it is freedom from religion and it is freedom from secular humanism. It is freedom to live life now, the, in, share to participate in the Father, Son, and Spirit's glorious, wonderful life that they live together, w- which we have been included in. That is scandalous to religion and to sector humanism. And you're about to see in our beloved country, you're about to see an awakening to that reality. And it's going to scare the religious and the secularist, but it's too late. Hmm. The light, the light is shining. 
I see it. So wow. Beautiful. So this lie of separation that you referred to, did those encounters with Jesus at a young age prevent you from ever really buying into that? Oh, I bought into it because it's it's the uh, the fallen imagination. But uh, what I didn't what I didn't. And I, again, I don't know why I'm any different. Uh, I don't know. Uh, other than the Lord, he called me and we've walked together and he has uh, found ways to use my folly to bring greater revelation. So the one thing that I did not bite into was the pose. Uh, religion creates a pose. This is what godliness looks like. You have to speak in hushed tones. You have to pray so much. You have to read and study your Bible. You have to. And so I, I, for whatever reason, I could see through that, and I did not want that. And I just said, Jesus, I, this is me. This is who I am. This is where I am in my journey. And he meets us there. And so he gives us what we can handle, and we walk with him, and then we get stuck, and he meets us in our stuckness, and he loves us, and he finds ways to the Holy Spirit, as I said, a redeeming genius. And she is always pulling the rabbit out of the hat of our mistakes and and turning a sin, our blindness, into revelations of Christ in us. So I knew I knew very early on, probably before 10, uh, I loved the the to think about union with Jesus. I don't know how that happened, but I I remember my mother says you you'd sit on the front porch swing and it squeaked, and I always knew as long as it was squeaking you was fine you were fine. But you would sit there for hours, and um, when it stopped squeaking, that meant one of two things: you either gone to sleep, or you you were getting in trouble. So she said she, <laughs> she would come and she could she could see she walked around the corner she could see out the uh, window if I had you know gone to sleep or if I was you know where I was and so anyway uh, I, I went to college at the University of Mississippi um, and uh, had a large time there uh, as we all did and after the parties almost every night. Um, or after every party, I would uh, walk in this field behind my dormitory, and I just cried out. I said, "There's more. There's more. I can't see it. What is it?" I, and my heart just yearned for. I see now. I was yearning for the freedom and the life that Jesus promised, but I didn't didn't know what that meant. I was still trapped in Calvinism, although I I just could not believe that God the Father was the way that the Calvinists portray Him to be. And uh, and when I was Toward the end of my time at Ole Miss, I went to the library and I checked out a book called On the Incarnation of the Word of God by Athanasius, which is, you can download this free off of our website or it's all over the web. It's a short book. He wrote it in his 20s. Uh, Athanasius attended uh, the Nicene Conference, uh, the Nicene Creed Conference. Uh, uh, he was 19 at the time. He was a deacon and uh, he was an attendant to Alexander, Bishop Alexander. Uh, and anyway, in reading the book, which is short and beautiful, section six, uh, one of the most beautiful uh, show-stopping statements I have ever read. There's two, in fact. One is that it's a double volume. The only incarnation is part two. Part one is against the pagans. But I read only incarnation first, and then went back and read. And in section six, this statement appears. It's not just a statement. This is his argument, but this is this was the the moment of breakthrough for me that took me forty years to unpack. What then was God being good to do when His creation was on the road to ruin? Now there is a vision of the goodness of God the Father. He's not good on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday, and then goes back to being what He really is. What is God being good to do when his creation, his people have lost the plot and are, and, and are on the road to ruin and lapsing into non-being? And the other statement from Contragentia or against the pagans is the God of all is good and supremely noble by nature. Therefore, he is the lover of the human race. 
And, and those two statements just like, they're so, oh, that's what I've been looking for. I've been, I, this is it's sung in my heart. And I thought, I, I can't even begin to believe. So um, somewhere, I think when I was 10, probably what was beginning to happen was I, without knowing it. I didn't know this for decades. But uh, basically, what, what the Lord has led me to is to reach into the sock of Western theology and grab the toe and turn the thing inside out. And it's taken me 61 years, and uh, I see it. Uh, it's beautiful. It's breathtaking. It's all about the doctrine of God. And it's all about uh, how big Jesus Christ is and how small we've made him. And bless our hearts, we actually think that we're making him Lord some of the stuff that we say and do is just it's just amazing. So I I say that one of my one of my mantras, I've got several paragraphical mantras. Here's one of them, my thesis statement. To speak the name of Jesus Christ biblically and with the early church is to say Father's eternal son. And it is to say Holy Spirit and only one, which is what Messiah means. And it is to say creator and sustainer of all things. Incarnate, crucified, resurrected, and ascended. And therefore, to speak the name of Jesus Christ biblically and with the early church is to say that the triune God, the human race, and creation, all creation, are not separated, but together in relationship Jesus himself is the relationship. Now, that's a, a big statement. It's simple. It's biblical. It's, it's right at the heart of the apostolic faith. Um, and we can talk about that uh, a little bit later. Uh, another one of my paragraphs that I love, uh, and there's a uh, six-minute video floating around the Internet on, that Michael LaFleur did on this one uh, called The Sacred Presence. The, uh, I was wrestling with the statement in the Psalms and in, in Proverbs that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And I thought, I just, it doesn't fit the beautiful vision of the Father that Jesus teaches us and shows us and reveals to us. And so I was looking through different commentaries and things, and I came across in, in uh, a rabbinic discussion that fear is not the right way to translate that word. It's more reverence. The reverence of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And I, I was just percolating on that through my Athanasius and early church uh, father's mind, through John's gospel, through Paul, Ephesians 1. And, and out comes this word, uh, recognition. Like, we don't, we don't, we're not subjects of the Queen of England, but if she was here, we would recognize her for who she is and treat her accordingly. Um, and I thought, think about recognition. I thought recognition means presence, not absence. So then comes this, and this is my statement. The recognition of the sacred presence of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in every person, moment, and place is the beginning of wisdom. Mm -hmm. The, rec the wow. recognition, The recognition of the sacred presence, not absence, um, of the Father, Son, and Spirit in every person, moment, and place is the end of religion, the end of secularism, and the beginning of seeing what is, which leads to our freedom. Jesus called this the light of life in John 8, 12. That's, that's a radical, from where we are, from where I started, a radical rethinking of everything that we think we know in the light of Jesus Christ. And my challenge to the, the so-called evangelical community is you have made Jesus Christ a footnote to Adam's fall. Mm. When Jesus Christ is the creator and sustainer of all things, what then is Jesus Christ to do when his bride has lost her mind and hates the light and in fact loves the darkness and is unwilling to come to him? What then is the Father to do? What then is the Holy Spirit to do? Well, it's right in front of our face. And so the Word becomes flesh. That's not even anthropos. It's, not, it's more than, and the Word became human. 
John knows the difference between Anthropos and Sarx. He's saying Jesus entered into our rejection and our darkness to find his bride, and he has. And he brought the Holy Spirit with him because the Holy Spirit and the Father and the Son are indivisibly one. You never have one without the other. And so the Holy Spirit has come in Jesus, as Irenaeus said, accustomed himself or herself to dwell with us in, in our flesh. And the Holy Spirit loves to turn the lights on uh, on the inside of us, in our darkness, in our stupidity, in our ca- catastrophic blindness. Oh, there's, uh, what does that mean? There it is. Now, Jesus is saying that take sides with the light, Baxter, against the way you think about my father. Uh, if you will take sides with me, Baxter, against the way you think about my father and learn from me, I promise you that I'm going to lead you to an experience of life that is inconceivable to you right now because you really got my father backwards. You need, you need to listen to me and let, let me teach you about the Holy Spirit, Baxter. And let me teach you. Here's another one. Take sides with me against the way you see yourself because you have a very broken sense of your self-worth. You have no idea what my father thinks about you. I'm like, okay, Jesus. Now, this is a long haul process. So in the process of, of walking this out in my own life, it's both personal and theological at the same time. So uh, I discovered Athanasius. I went to seminary, Reformed Theological Seminary, because that's what I grew up, Presbyterian. And I sat on the back row the whole time. <laughs> I'm just like, Athanasius was whispering in my ear like, Baxter, these good men are flying past the incarnation on the way to get to their view of the cross, and they have missed the point. Incarnation means that God has come to be with you. Not the Sunday version of you, not the pretense opposing you, but you, as you are in your brokenness, pitch their tent inside your darkness. And so Irenaeus, who was a disciple of Polycarp, who was a disciple of St. John, in 180, or thereabouts, wrote uh, against the heresies. And in in the preface to Book 5, he says this, Our blessed Lord Jesus Christ, who is transcendent, became what we are to bring us to be what he is in himself. The mission of Jesus is to share himself with us and his life with his Father in the Holy Spirit, with us in our darkness, and lead us out of darkness in the light. In order to do that, he had to die. In order to do that, he had to rise again. In order to do that, he had to ascend. Uh, But that's the heart of it. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 8. uh, You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, he became poor, that we might be made wealthy. Well, when was Jesus rich? Paul has envisioned there the eternal life of God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the eternal treasures of that life. He was rich. He became poor. He became what we are. He entered into our darkness. In fact, Paul says, he who knew no sin, no wrong thinking, became sin in order that we might become the righteousness of God, the right relationship with God. And so that's the mission of Jesus, is to find his bride in the place where she hates him, hates the light, loves the darkness, and is prostituting herself in religion and secularism to find her, lay hold of her, enter into her darkness down to the very bottom, bring the Holy Spirit and the Father with him, turn the lights on. And that's what's happening right now all over the world. The lights are being turned on inside of people. I love that in Galatians chapter um, 1, the Apostle Paul. Uh, in Acts, he uh, the his conversion experience is narrated three different times, and it always appears as though it's external, like a light appeared to him outside of himself, uh, knocked him to the ground. But in Galatians, he uses a very specific language. It's very, very beautiful. So how does God, how does God change a Pharisee? Pharisees have memorized the book. If there's any Pharisee on earth at the time that that probably could have argued with Jesus theologically, which is really not, but it would have been Saul of Tarsus. So what does God do? It says, God who set me apart from my mother's womb, verse 15, 16. God who set me apart from my mother's womb when he was pleased to reveal his son in me. 
not to me. That's external, in me. Jesus has found his way inside of our darkness, inside of our sin, inside of our catastrophic blindness, and the Holy Spirit turned the light on, and it took about two seconds. And Saul of Tarsus became the great apostle Paul, and he never looked back. But he had to go through a whole, uh, you can imagine how that one revelation of Jesus in him uh, blew his mind, and he had to go away and rethink everything he thought he knew. That's what the Lord is leading us in the West on right now. We're, we're getting to rethink everything we thought we knew. And we know a lot of things. We've just been looking at them from a, a skewed angle, and that's all getting clear. It's beautiful. So when I went to Reform Seminary, I sat on the back row. Um, fast forward, Athanasius is, is hammering me, uh, haunting me in a good way, won't let me go. Irenaeus, John's Gospel, uh, Paul, Ephesians 1. So I ended up going to Scotland to study under Professor James B. Torrance. And um, he he was one of the, uh, his older brother, Thomas F. Torrance, I had begun to read and realized as I read T.F. Torrance, who's uh, published uh, prolifically, one of the leading, he was one of the leading English-speaking theologians in the world. And I wanted to do work on his thought, but he had retired, so I went and studied with his brother. But when I first read T.F. Torrance when I was in seminary, I realized that this man is Athanasius. He's singing the same song, and he's written a bunch of stuff on Athanasius, and I wanted to know more, and I did. And that's uh, So in 1987, I wrote a letter to my friend David Upshaw. This was less than a year from the time that Beth and I arrived in Scotland. I wrote a letter that I found not long ago, a copy of it, and it was all in place. I saw it, that, that Athanasius, the early church, the Nicene Creed, the apostles start, John starts his gospel here, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the word with there, in our translation, with, it's pros in Greek, and uh, the word, it means to be turned towards, be face to face. This is where John starts his gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was face to face with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning face to face with God. All things came into being through him, and not one thing has come into being that has come into being. In him was life, and this life in him was the light of men, or the light of humanity. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not overcome it or understand it. Uh, John's going to spend his entire gospel telling us more about what the darkness is and what the light is. But the darkness, simply put, is the assumption of separation. And once you assume it, you create something that you can see. And when you don't see what is, which is Jesus' union with the human race, you create something that you can see, which is religion or or secular humanism, we could call it self-effort. And so the word becomes flesh. I'm not going to have it. Not on my watch. I didn't create you to perish. You're my bride. I love you. We don't do abandonment. My father's not fickle. He, Athanasius says he doesn't create grudgingly. It's beautiful. He doesn't create grudgingly like Jesus is twisting his arm. And he, the father would rather be, be on about something else. He cre- creates out of the same eternal love that he has for his son. The same love calls into being through his son, a creation of a human race. And when it went sideways, you can hear the Father, Son, and Spirit together saying, no, 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 not on our watch. We did not create you to perish and we're throwing all in to bring about redemption. That's who we are. We over here believe that God is angry with us and has to be appeased. And you get the whole story unfolding. And and then we're trying to figure out how Jesus, we actually got Jason, I, I, we actually have in our West Protestant tradition enshrined as the central truth of the gospel an idea, a notion that the Father and the Son are different, that the Son can actually become human, and in fact, as Apostle Paul is bold to say, can become sin, and the Father is fundamentally different from the Son. He can't even look at us. He's so disgusted with us. And so Jesus has to go and do something on the cross that change the Father's mind about us so that he can then accept us. I'd say that is the utter blasphemy. We learn 
If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I and the Father are so close. We, our relationship is so right. It's so unclouded with doubt and fear. The only way you can talk about the relationship of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is to use the word one, indivisibly one, without loss of personhood. That's what the word perichoresis means. So that's our non-negotiable. We are not to say anything that in any way denigrates the indivisible oneness of the Father, Son, and Spirit. Uh Uh-oh, we got to rethink now what is going on on the cross because the cross is not Jesus making a sacrifice to his Father. The cross is the Son of the Father in the Father and the Father in him in the Holy Spirit, finding his way down to the bottom of the abyss of our confusion and our sin and our unbelief, and he's going to pitch his tent there with us forever and ever and ever. And the Holy Spirit's going to turn the lights on. So these are big concepts. Now I've got to rethink a lot of things. And fortunately, uh, we don't have to go far because that's what the New Testament is saying, and that's what the early church is saying. So we're being called back to our real family tradition. And I recognize, I mean, I grew up in Prentice, Mississippi. That's not only in Mississippi, that's in South Mississippi. And I grew up in a Calvinist church, an evangelical Calvinist church. I understand what this sounds like. I understand how, quote, radical it is. It's not radical. It's not new. I'm not saying anything new. The early church didn't believe that Jesus took some sort of infinite whipping from his father so that we could get a ticket to go to heaven when we die. And Lord knows we all we all dread it. What are we going to do in heaven? The father doesn't really want us there. The only reason he's there is that Jesus has, has made a sacrifice. And so what? we're just going to hang around hiding from the father underneath Jesus' robe. And what happens? He has to go to the bathroom. You know, uh uh-oh, I'm standing before God. That is so foreign to the love of the Father and his adoration and his enjoyment and his love for us. And and all of this is so real to me, but it it came home so powerfully, the theology of this. When the birth of our first grandchild, Caroline, I have a T-shirt that says, I am Caroline. And because of the lesson, it wasn't a lesson that I learned. It was just confirmed in some deep place inside of me. Because the minute Laura, our daughter, told us that she was pregnant, I watched two extended families fall in love. We didn't know if it was a boy or girl. It didn't matter. And we went to work to help Laura and Kyle prepare for the birth uh, of Caroline. We found out later it was a girl. Two extended families pledging all their resources, time, and effort to be a blessing for this child that was on the way to being here. And the day that Laura, that Caroline was born, the day after, we got to go in and see her. And Rodney, who was Kyle's father, was there. Kyle was holding Caroline and was crying. It was so beautiful. And Rodney walks over, and he whispers in Kyle's ear. I'm close enough that I can hear it. And he said, Kyle, now you know how we've always felt about you. Wow. And I said, man, that's the gospel. That's the gospel. That's what Jesus is trying to help us see, how the Father has always felt about us and how he prepared a creation for us and how he he knew us by name before we we were born and how he's waited. And once we got here, how thrilled he is. We've lost our minds and we can't change him. I, I look at Caroline and now Cooper and now Jeb I have three grandchildren. I think, guys, I hope you have a great life, and I hope you don't have a whole lot of trouble. But I'm going to tell you something. You you don't have a vote on how I feel about you. You can't do anything or think anything that's going that can even dent how I feel about you. And I'm I, when I say that and I think about that thing, I'm either better than God the Father, which is ludicrous, of course. The point is that I'm participating. In my love for my grandchildren, I'm participating in the way the Father loves us. That love doesn't originate in my heart. It comes straight from the Father's heart. Share with me through the Son in the Spirit, and I get to love my grandchildren with it. I get to pledge myself. I am in this for your good. And and some a year later from Caroline's birth or thereabouts, we're all together on a Sunday afternoon, both sides of the family. I think it was somebody's birthday or something. And, and it was Sunday, and the Sunday afternoon we were watching a football game, and, and Caroline was over on the floor, and she pulled herself up by a chair. 
And suddenly she just took three steps. And we all applauded. We just, and it scared her. And she wasn't sure if she'd done a good thing or bad thing. Then she realized she'd done a good thing. So she took three or four more steps. And I, I just watched it. And I thought, yeah, yeah. Now, let me, let me tell you what the Western God would do in that situation. Because we all remember, the family remembers when Caroline wasn't here. And she's here now. And now she's taking steps. But the Western God would say, Caroline, I saw you take those steps. That's pretty good. That's okay. But I haven't made up my mind about you yet. I tell you what, after you win the Olympic gold medal in the 100-meter dash three times in a row, I'll, I'll consider thinking about you, and then we'll talk. That's the Western God. That is not God at all. The Father remembers when we were nothing more than a dream, and now we're here, and he can't. And this is the language of the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies, in Jesus, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him face to face, just like he is with his, with his son. He predestined us to adoption as sons and daughters through Jesus Christ to the praise of his glorious grace. And he, he uses this word lavish and read it in the message. He, he kind of gets close to it in the message. This is talking about our father. Our Father doesn't do abandonment. He does blessing. And even His judgments are flowing out of His fatherhood. I didn't create you to perish, and you've you got to be delivered from this darkness. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get inside in my Son. So this is not a new gospel. This is the gospel. This is what the early church was teaching. This is why we have the Nicene Creed. And, and I remember uh, many years ago now, this one fellow, he was really upset with me. You can't just go around and tell people they're included or they're adopted. I said, well, why not? He said, because you don't know if they've repented and believed yet or not. I'm like, wait wait a minute. Wait a minute. You're telling me that God becomes their father when they repent and believe. He says, yeah, that's what I said. You're telling me that your faith has the power to change God? I said, what is God 20 minutes before I repent and believe? He said, he's your judge. I said, dude, that's some sick stuff. Let me tell you, the Nicene Creed is very, very deliberate. John is very deliberate in anchoring his entire gospel in the Father-Son relationship. That means that God is Father before he is Creator. That means that all of God's actions are fatherly, sonly, familial. The Nicene Creed, we believe in one God, the Father, Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, and all things visible and invisible. Note the order. Note the order. It is deliberate. You can see this in Athanasius, who spent his life defending the Nicene Creed. It does not say we believe in God Almighty, Maker of all things. It places the almightiness of God and the creating of God inside The first thing, which is fatherhood. We believe in one God, the Father, maker. Creation flows from the fatherhood of God. And in the next paragraph, the Nicene Creed, and we believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, because he's not father without the son. And that was the argument with Arianism. And Athanasius says beautifully that the Holy Trinity is no created thing. Arius said there was a time when God was not father because the son was not yet created. And you see, you see, fatherhood is eternal. Everything that God thinks, does, responds to, how he responds flows out of the father's relationship with his son in the Holy Spirit. Now we're being Christian. Now we're thinking like Christians. Let's pull that thread and see see what has to be undone and see what a beautiful priceless, precious, and indeed powerful message emerges that awakens people to their true family of origin. Caroline does not have her family of origin in Laura and Kyle. 
Her family of origin is the Father, Son, and Spirit. That's who she belongs to. That's why Jesus says, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit, because we are the family of origin. And we, when we preach this, people, people begin to come alive because we're, we're not telling them that God, God may become one day their father if they repent and believe. And I always ask people, if it's all about our repentance and believing, which is, if that's what this is about, is there anybody in this room? Raise your hand if you are now successfully beyond, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Nobody can raise their hand. Well, what does that mean then? That God, on Tuesday morning, when I when I got my blood sugar up and I'm I'm on a roll with the with the Word of God and the Gospel, that, that God's my Father. But Tuesday afternoon, when I fell off the, the truck again, uh, God ceases to be my Father and goes back to being what He eternally is, which is Judge. This is some some confused and sick stuff. I know that people all over the world believe it. That's fine with me. I never set out to convince anybody of what I'm saying is the truth. I set out to find the truth that sets us free. And I can give you the verse that summarizes it all best, best of any is John 14, 20. Jesus says in the upper room to the disciples who are scared, he says, I'm not going to leave you open. I'm going to come to you and I'm going to ask the father. And he's going to send the Holy Spirit to you. And in that day, this is verse 20. You hear that siren going off? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I hear it. That's okay. Thank you. No, that's that's a cloud of witnesses. Uh-huh. Pay, pay attention. Pay attention. <laughs> Listen. No. Uh, John fourteen twenty. In that day, Jesus says, "You will know that I am in my Father." Now it's the incarnate Son speaking this, mind you. That I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. That's what Jesus came to do, to find his way inside of us, in in his relation of oneness with his Father, in the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit's turning the lights on. That's the discovery of faith. Faith is not something we do that gets us across the divide, supposedly, to God, and therefore, then we're justified, then we're saved, then we're reconciled, then we're adopted. Faith is a discovery that Jesus is in his Father, and I'm in him. Embraced, loved, with an almighty bear hug in the sun, and Jesus is in me. Oh, my goodness, how embarrassing that I thought I was the one doing all this. I thought this my religion was, had its origin in me. I thought my burdens and my creativity started with me, and I'm offering them up to a distant deity in my, in my self-righteousness. No, 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 no. Faith is the discovery of what is, of what God has established. And our vote was to damn Jesus. Now, I'm telling you, that is that sets you free. You begin to say, Jesus, are you really? I, I can get the you're in the Father. That's not so big a stretch, but I'm in you. How did I get in you? <laughs> That's the work of Jesus. And you're in me. What does that even mean? But actually, I'll tell you what it means. You know how you love Caroline and Cooper and Jim? That's not your love. That's the love of the Father that I have together. And I share it with you, and you get to love your grandchildren. And, and you're so blind, you think you're that good. You're not meant to be that good. You're meant to share in me. And that's what's happening. And the last verse in Jesus' prayer in John 17, verse 26, the last verse of his prayer before he turns toward the cross. He says, Father, I have made you known, your name, you, known to them. They don't know you. That's the problem. But I have managed to find my way inside the dark. I have made you known to them. And I love this part. And I will make you known in order that, get this, in order that the love with which you love me may be in them and I in them. When he had spoken these words, he proceeded forth, and that's when the whole uh, movement toward the cross begins in John's gospel. Astounding, astounding, that the love with which you love me may be in them, that they could know what I know. When I look you in the face and I hear you say to me, you are my beloved son in whom my soul is thrilled. 
They're going to know that. And when they know that, Father, I will lift their face from their shame, from their brokenness, from their forlorn sense of worth. I will lift their face, Father, and they will see through my eyes at you and they will know know who you really are and therefore who they really are. Man, I'm telling you that this is the real undiluted gospel. And it is so powerful. It quickens us. And we all want to argue. We can't be that simple. Actually, well, it is that simple. You were loved before the foundation of the world. And you were brought into being the Father, Son, and Spirit of thrill. And they're determined to deliver you from your delusional thinking and the belief and set you free so that you can be exactly who you are, loved by the Father, Son, and Spirit. I mean, think of it this way. Let's suppose that, that um, well, let, me, let me tell you a, a story in, and then uh, we'll move on to some other questions. But I was one morning about uh, 8 o'clock, I'd made a cup of coffee, and I sat down in my chair at the house, and I had one of my 20 books that I read, read at the same time. And I picked up a book, and I'm sitting too. there reading. <laughs> I, I'm sitting there, well, you, just, you, you don't want to miss anything good, you know. Like, right. <laughs> so I, I was just having a cup of coffee and reading a book, and, uh, and the garage door opened. So I thought, well, it's got to be one of the children, because they're the only ones that, that – you know, have a garage door opener. And so for long, I mean, seconds later, I hear the doorbell go off 50 times. So I know it's the grandchildren. And then Cooper manages to open the door. He's first. He sees the back of my head in the chair. He comes flying over there and he sees me reading. He grabs a book, crawls up my lap and says, read. So, and about that time, Caroline comes in. She sees Cooper in my lap reading. So she grows, and it's a little bit of a uh, little package of five books, uh, Peter Rabbit books, I think they are. They're real small. She grabbed that, crawls up on the other side of my lap, and then they commence to fight over which one we're going to read first. And I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden, tears were flowing down my cheek. I just think, this is so beautiful. You see, it never crossed their mind that they were not wanted that they were not adored and welcomed. And so in the freedom of that knowledge, which is Jesus' knowledge of the Father, they did the most natural thing, which is crawl up my lap and read together. And I, I replayed that scenario in my head as uh, this way, just as a thought experiment about Western Christianity. Suppose that Laura is driving over to the house and says, hey, we're going to see Doc and Gigi. And suppose that somebody has been whispering in Caroline and Cooper's ear that Doc is mean as a snake, and he doesn't really like them. He doesn't really want them in his house. And so they're two miles out, and Laura says, hey, we're going to go see Doc and Gigi, and they trigger. Oh, gosh, what are we going to do? Cooper, what are we going to do? I know what we can do. We will walk in very quietly. And we will go back in the back bedroom so that Doc doesn't even know we're there. And that way he can't get angry at us. And we'll play quietly until it's time to leave. And then suppose somebody meets him back in the room and says, well, if you want Doc to love you, I can tell you how to do it. Here's what you got to do. But you got to get it right. <laughs> the, the sheer folly and madness of it. Then they could spend their entire life trying to find a way into my heart. It's a delusion. I loved them before they were born. They can't do anything to change how I feel about them. I, they're not that powerful, and we're not powerful enough to change the way the Father feels about, about us. Even if we create and we, we tar Papa's face with the brush of our own infidelity, which is what Adam did. He created a God of his own imagination, and he hid in the bushes, and he wasn't coming out. And so what did the father do? I understand how lost you are in the cosmos of your own fallen mind. I understand that you think I'm an ogre, that I don't love you. You, you don't have a clue. I understand you're hiding. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to meet you in your darkness, and I'm going to close you. Not for me, but for you. So you would at least come out from the tree. And we can begin a conversation. It's going to be a long, long conversation. But eventually, my, my son's going to get in inside that tree with you. And he's going to get inside your mind. And he's going to help you see who I really am. And then, then we can begin to dance. Uh, that's the story of the Bible. It's the, it's the most stunning love story in history. 
And we've turned it, as my friend Bruce Walk up in Adelaide, Australia, loves to say, we've turned it into a horror flick. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't and, that the and, truth? And we wonder why nobody's listening. Right. We wonder, Nobody we wants wonder what why, we're selling. Oh, man, it's just like, so I, I get to travel around. I used to go around the world, and I just do it on Zoom, but and tell people, <laughs> and tell people, let me, let me read. Uh, uh, just a quick quote. Uh, I've been going on and on, but you ask a question and you ask me that question. You to look out. I mean, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> uh, um, so this, this, I've been reading a book by uh, my friend Douglas Campbell, um, New Te- one of the one of the world's leading New Testament scholars. This is his newest book, I think, called Paul, Pauline Dogmatics: uh, The Triumph of God's Love. And he says on um, page twenty six, this was. I almost dropped the book when I read this out of sheer undiluted joy that a New Testament scholar, uh, I I challenge you to find this statement in any New Testament uh, scholar writing in, in the last 200 years. Here it is. He says, quote, I will therefore refer in what follows to the God Paul obeyed as the Trinity and will it explicate much that he recommended in fundamentally Trinitarian terms, because this is what God has revealed in Jesus through the Spirit is really like, triune. And then he proceeds to do the whole of Paul's theology from that perspective, which I think is just, is not only the truth, it's just breathtaking. Uh, I, I just, oh man, because New Testament scholarship has been locked in what I would call the Germanic, the Babylonian captivity of the German Enlightenment, and it's been not paying attention to the gospel. And now it is. Now it's like, man, how beautiful is that? I'm going to read this thing from a Trinitarian perspective because that's what Paul is saying. Hey, friends, this is Jason. Listen, we've had a two-hour conversation with Baxter Kruger, and it was just incredible. There's so much to process and so much to unpack that we've decided to divide this conversation into two episodes. So you've just heard the first part. This conversation will pick up right where it left off on next week's episode, and I can't wait for you to hear it. Uh, In the meantime, I think what you've heard today is worth reflecting on. How can we enter into the union that Jesus has given us with God? And what are the implications of that for our lives? What are the implications of that for our relationships with each other? Uh, It's incredible stuff to think about. And I can't wait to pick up this conversation right here next week. And I'm so grateful that you're listening. And I look forward to seeing you again soon.